It's been, it's been a warm one out there, huh? You guys stoked to be back inside? Yeah? No? No, you guys are not there. It's crazy, huh? They were, they're rowdier outside than they're on inside. What happens? Nice and, nice and calm now, huh? All the luxuries of the first world are kicking in, huh? Um, no, it's good, it's good. Uh, uh, yeah. We're going to continue with We Can, which is a, a, a theme that we've been preaching for the last two months. And, um, you know, the, the big thing uh, that our church wanted to focus on this, this year was having communion and realization and awareness of who the Holy Spirit is. Right? Like, we all, we all get who God the Father is, we understand, most of us. And we definitely know who Jesus is. But sometimes the third person, the Spirit of the Lord, uh, gets kind of put on the, on the back burner or on the back seat. And we don't, we don't put him as part of the three. It's kind of like a lesser, lesser known deity, and it's not true, right? And, um, and so I, I feel like humans, humans, human beings are complicated people. We're just a complicated, uh, uh, you know, body with, with, uh, you know, complicated nerve system and uh, immune system and all these things. And each one, each one of us is unique, right? God made us unique. He made us come from various backgrounds. We all have different personalities, we all have different histories, but with respect to the Lord, we're all actually the same. Right? If I, was, if I was to get a cut, I would bleed. If you were to get a cut, you would bleed. I mean, if you, if you're, if you don't bleed, then something's wrong with you. It's crazy. You're a zombie. You know? But we're all, we're all the same. And the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, that we were all created in three parts, spirit, soul, and body. Just like the Lord, three in one. We were created in his design. He is one of three, the Holy Spirit is one of three. Us, we're tri, a tripart body. And it says that, and the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly. And may your spirit, soul, and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible tells us that we're three pieces. We have a spirit, we have a soul, and we have a body. And we have, you know, it's crazy that we have access to unlimited resources to discover, to learn, to observe. All, all the, anything that we want to learn, we can Google it right now, and it'll pop up. Most things. And it seems like all these things that the world wrestles with, especially now more than ever, right? The world wrestles with society. The world wrestles with race. The world wrestles with world politics. The world wrestles with identity. All these things. And although mankind has done huge, huge things, mankind has done marvelous things. It's, it, it, it's, 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 it's built things. It's, it's, it's done all these wonderful things. Yet, we find ourselves that we know less and less about ourselves than we actually did long ago. It's crazy that I can, you know, my, I can have a conversation with my dad, and my dad knows exactly who he is. I can have a conversation with my mom, my mom knows exactly who she is. I can have a conversation with my nephew, and there's issues. It seems like more and more that the generation, as, as the next generation comes, they don't know who they are. And it seems like the more information that we have, the less we know about ourselves. You know, uh, it's kind of like, um, I don't know, like I come, I have sangre indígena, right? Like my parent, my family comes from, my dad's an indigenous blood, right? And the joke's always on my house, is like, oh, you know, like my, my dad's a, a retired carpenter, and we always crack jokes, my dad can build anything. And I was used to say, dad, well, how do you build all this stuff without measuring stuff, you know? Measure twice, cut once, and he's not like that. He goes, he's always to joke. He goes, it's in, it's in my blood. I know how to build things. My aunt, he goes, my ancestors, they build pyramids and stuff. It's, you know, it's in our blood now. And yet, we can't figure out what the heck they were building. But they knew what they were building. We say, oh, they're primitive. Well, it seems like they were more in tune with spiritual things than we are today. 
whether it's right or wrong, it doesn't matter, that they, they, they were in tune with something. Why? Because they understood that most old religions, I don't care what it is, most old religions understood that there's a spirit, a body, and a soul. Most people in this room only understand body and soul. Because you probably watch a Pixar movie that tells you about your soul. That's why. But we don't understand the spirit. And that's why we continue every day have trials and tribulations that we bring upon ourselves because we don't understand the spirit. And that's, and this, ironically, that's what the Holy, that's what God left before he left, before Jesus ascended. That's the one thing he left on earth for us to have. The spirit. Right? Can I get up? Amen. There you go. And so, well, all the modern conveniences, I feel like my father, all these things like my dad, things that my dad didn't have, I feel like he was more at peace and he was stronger than the things that we have now. And as our knowledge of the natural world has increased, our knowledge of spiritual things have decreased. And it's because man's ignorance blindly believes that all of life's problems can be solved by one thing, me. And that's what we're told. That's what we're told. You can, you can figure it out yourself. Or someone has to tell you how to figure it out. Because we're ignorant to the things of God. And let me tell you guys one thing. There can be no peace outside of me if there is no peace inside of me. There is no peace outside if there is no peace inside and that's what, what the Holy Spirit, that's what the Holy Spirit deals with. Giving us peace inside. So whatever comes outside of me, I won't waver, I won't budge, I won't tremble, I won't fear, I won't blaspheme, I won't do all, I won't run away from things, I will face them head on. And this is the whole universe. And all the wisdom that's out there is ignorant to the world of the Spirit. And I'm not just talking about the spiritual realm outside of us, because we all know it's very easy for us to have the, the recognition that, yeah, there's, there is a spiritual world outside of us. You know what the Bible says? There's a spiritual being inside of you. So we recognize the spiritual things outside of us, but yet we forsake the spiritual things happening inside of us. So I want to I narrow it down to what is the Holy Spirit doing in your life? Amen? And, and we are, you know, we aren't evolved animals, guys. I don't care what Darwin told you. You know Charles Darwin on, on his deathbed? He pretty much denied his own theory, his own thesis. Yet someone took, someone took it seriously, but he still teach that today. You know, I might look like a gorilla, but I'm not a gorilla. You know? The Bible tells us in Genesis 1.26 that we were created in God's image and likeness. So if you're creating God's image and likeness, that means if God, the Father, is spiritual, what does that make you? Spiritual. That means God, God made you a spirit being. There's a spirit being inside of you. Right? And the ultimate way to control bad behavior, guess what? It isn't by laws. It isn't by laws. Obviously, that's not working. It is not by metal detectors everywhere you go. Obviously, that's not working. And it's not social engineering or social things because obviously that's not working. It's changing the hearts of people one at a time. And I can't do it. Brother Vikas can't do it. Brother Guy can't do it. Sister Abby can't do it. Only Yeshua can do it. Only Jesus can do that. Because that is a spiritual thing that only spiritual beings can do. And God has, has made us work like that. Yet sadly, many Christians have lost the spiritual point of view. And very few Christians know who they are in the spirit. And it's very easy. When you have a trial and tribulation come in your life, what's the number one thing you do? Do you panic? Or do you give it to God? What about your marriage? You're those who are married in here. There's an argument happening. Do you yell at your spouse, or do you give it to God? It's argument. 
What about your kids? When your kids aren't walking in the Lord, or when your kids are doing their own thing, do you get angry at them? Do you lash at them? Or do you give it up to God? Do you do, do you do and handle things in the physical world, or do you handle and do things in the, in the spiritual world? Hmm? Wait. In fact, there's one big misconception that religion has taught, taught us, and that is that we are sinners by nature. We are sinners by nature. Right? That's what, we, that's, that's what we're told. But the more I read the Bible, it teaches the opposite. It's true that we're all born sinners, right? Psalms 51 5 literally says, Psalm 51, that I'm born a sinner. And have the nature of the devil working in us. That's what Ephesians 2 says. But when, there's a big but here. But when we come to Christ and receive salvation, we become a new person in the spirit. Do you guys know that? Do you guys know when you guys become a Christian that you have a new identity? That you're no longer your old, the old person? That's why, that's why when you used to be a jerk and a brat and what else back in the day, and people talk to you now, they're like, man, they, you're a completely different person? That's because God gave you a new identity. You're no longer that person. And a lot, of, a lot of us don't even realize that. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, This means that anyone who belongs in, to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. Check that out. The old life, by Felicia, is gone. And the new life has begun. And this is crazy. This isn't, this isn't talking about your body. This isn't talking about you, you as an individual. It's talking about your spiritual self. Your spiritual self. See, you were, you were born the way you were, whether you're a man or a woman. You were, you were the same way before you accepted Christ. And now that I'm, right, I'm a man before I knew Christ, and I'm a man still when I know Christ. So that didn't change. So my body didn't change, and my soul didn't change, because the Bible says that the soul is the mental, emotional part of your body. Your soul is what, what makes you catch your feelings. That's what the soul does. It's an antenna. It makes you realize inside here. That's that didn't automatically change either. And all those things are subject to change. But when you have a renewed, when you renew your mind to experience change in your mind and your emotions, that's when the Holy Spirit comes. If the Holy Spirit talks to your mind, it talks to your soul, and it causes you to change those emotions. Right? But in the spirit, you become a brand new species of being. Your spirit is totally new. There isn't old sin nature left in you. When you become a new person, when you become someone in Christ, that sin, old sin nature is no longer in you. Why would Jesus, why would Jesus die on the cross so that you can still live foul today? And you know him. That doesn't make any sense. Why would salvation come and yet salvation, God didn't die so you can still live the way you want to live? That's, that doesn't make any sense. Now, but don't make, not as, it don't make sense. So that's not... You, that, that's, not, that's not summing up. And I know it comes completely as a shock to many of you who have been indoctrinated with the religious lie that you can still be you and still love Jesus. That doesn't, that cannot happen. You can't serve two masters. Last time I checked. That can't happen. But most Christians have been taught to believe that after salvation, they are still the same at the core. That's a lie. That's a lie. I am not the same person I was at my core. I am no longer suicidal. I am no longer a depressed being. At my core, I am alive. At my core, I am saved. At my core, I have a new identity. At my core, I have a new name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In my core, I am a citizen of heaven. How can I be a citizen of a place I've never been to unless I've been there? All the things that God, all the things that Jesus has mandated and spoken to existence, I reap on those benefits. Why? Because I have a new identity. My spiritual being is alive in the Lord. That's why. That's why. And you can't believe there's a lie that you have two natures. It's impossible to have two natures according to what the Bible teaches. I, I, I don't know. 
I, I don't know that. I didn't even know it. And please explain to me somewhere where, there, where, where in the Bible where it's okay to be a Christian schizophrenic. Like you're this one moment and then you're this another moment. Tell me, where is that in the Bible? Tell me where is that in the Bible? All I know is the Bible says is that when you become to Christ, the old person dies. And the new person is now begun. There is no wishy-washy. There is no left and right. Either you are or you don't. Either you walk the walk and talk the talk, or you just shut up. There, there's, no, there's no in between. There's no in between. And Paul dealt with those issues in Romans 6. Man, I'm telling you, if you guys have not studied Romans 6, and you want to feel bad about yourself, read Romans. It's the greatest reality check ever written. Book of Romans. Outside of the Gospels of Jesus. And Paul powerfully proved that in, in the preceding chapters that God deals with us with grace through faith, that the logical question was this, what Paul asked. This is, and this is more rhetorical, I think, I don't know. Shall we, this is Romans 6, 1 says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Look at that question. Shall we continue to be sinners if we have, if we have grace? Is that even possible? Is that even possible what Paul's writing on, 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 on there? Of course not. That's not what Paul was saying. And he gave two reasons in the chapter of why Christians should live holy. And the first part of this is, is Romans 6 2. It says, How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You are dead to sin. Sin does no longer exist. Does anybody know what dead means? It's done, right? Fini. Finished. No resurrection. It's done. It's dead. So if you're a Christian in this place, if you're a quote unquote cash cow Christian in this place, and you're not dead to sin, yo, you gotta, you gotta, you have to, you have to deal with that with the Lord. Because I'm dead to sin. I mind you, it's not saying perfect. It's not saying that you will sin. I'm saying that your nature, your spiritual nature, is dead to sin. That's why, when you, if your spiritual nature is practiced and, and, and you know what the Word of God says, you can walk away from temptations. You don't always have to be right. You know, you don't always have to win an argument. You don't always have to be the best in everything. It's okay. It's okay. You can walk away. Mind you, I'm talking about your nature, your soul, your nature, your spirit, your nature. Right? And then, and then Paul and then Paul keeps going. He goes, and that's a radical statement. And many of the majority of, of, of Christianity doesn't talk about that. Because the majority of Christianity preaches moralism. It preaches if you're a good person, then you can be a good person, you know, you can do good things. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. They believe that they are alive to sin. Can you imagine? That's what moralism teaches. That you can still be alive and still be sinning. Because it's okay, because none of us are perfect, and that, that's that. And that's the excuse. There is no try harder. There is no be more disciplined. They don't teach you that. They just say, that's it. Voila, fini, you're done. But that's not what Paul believed. Paul said that once we are baptized into Christ, it's Romans 6, 3, we experience a death to our old sin nature. It's dead, it's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. And, 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 and the people, can, I mean, I can literally, I know some, man, if I, if I can read your minds, you'd be like, man, Javier, you're crazy, bro. I still struggle with many sins. I'm not dead to sin. Like, Paul mentioned that in Romans 7, you read it. But Paul's not talking about our flesh. He's talking about our spirit. And the only reason we still sin is because we don't know these truths. You guys hear what I just said? The really reason why we continue sinning is because we don't know those truths. The Bible even says the truth will set you free. So if you don't know the truths that are lying in the Word of God, then how can you be set free? That's why some of us still deal with pornography. That's why some of us still deal with alcohol or lust or greed or cheating or stealing. Right? Or slander, or gossip, or disobedience. Should I keep going? That's why we deal with those things. Why? Because we believe 
that we're alive still, but it's because sin's there, it's okay. I'm not perfect, and that's the cop-out. That's not what the Bible's saying. Our nature has to change. How many of you guys here are, are computer nerds? Other than me. No? Alright. And another person in the back. <laughs> well, I think maybe the reason why I like computers, I can relate to them, is because where I can relate computers to humans is that they're the same. Our brain and the computer is very much the same. Unless it's reprogrammed, it's still going to work like it's always worked before. And the, what the Lord does is, the Lord does is He comes and He reprograms our computer to work a different way. Does that make sense? And and if we keep, you know, if we keep doing things the way we've always done, is that we our computer system is always going to fail unless someone comes in, administers something new or some kind of update, and then, and it helps us move forward and operate the, and efficiently the way we're supposed to be. That's what, the, that's what the Holy Spirit does. Is that we were all born in sin. Amen? I know this. But we have our old sin nature programmed in our minds. And that sin nature programs us to be selfish. It programs us to be bitter, angry, lustful, etc. But when we're born again, John 3.3 3 tells us we become totally new in our spirits. Amen? This old nature has been completely changed, completely reprogrammed. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that. It's not in the process of becoming new. See, I'm not in the process of becoming perfect. I'm not in the process of becoming pure. I'm already pure. I'm already perfect. Ooh, that's, that's blasphemy. No, it's not. Because that didn't come from me. That's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus died for. When Jesus died, he, he, he is perfect, he is pure, and I reap those benefits. See, my, my, spiritual, my spiritual nature recognizes that. That I, not me, is perfect. He is perfect. And so in Christ, I reap those things. I reap God's, God's perfection. I reap God's blessings. I reap all those things because Jesus himself accomplished those things on Golgotha. On the cross and through the resurrection. That's why we have these things. That's what Paul calls that's the resurrection life. How can you have a resurrection life if you haven't died? Romans 6 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. He's telling us right there. If you died to sin, and if you resurrect, you're going to resurrect like he did, to, to his accomplishments, to his glory. Amen? But in the very next verse, Paul drops another bomb. And we need to know something before we can experience that. He says this, the first thing he mentions, is Romans 6, 6, says, Our old self is crucified with Christ or with him. This isn't something that has yet to happen. It's something that does happen. And it doesn't happen over and over again. It only happens one time. It's a done deal. When you become, when you know Jesus in your heart, it's a done deal. You don't do it over and over again. It's like the same people are trying to get baptized over and over. The first one didn't count. The second one, uh, maybe. The third one, uh, I, I was church hopping. It's not really my church. Stop. Stop with that. Stop playing. Stop playing Sunday school. Get right with the Lord. Stop playing these games. And then Paul adds on to six, the second part of uh, Romans 6, 6. Then Paul says that the body of sin might be destroyed. Come on. That the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth, I like that word. I, I, I took this one. It's not different, but I took it. It just says henceforth. We should not serve sin or not be a slave to sin. I'm not, I'm not a slave to sin anymore. You know, I'm not a I'm not a person that lives off my flesh. You know, 2002, October 2002. Before that, man, like you know, whatever. I, I, that was a terrible me. And once I met the Lord, that's an, I'm a new me. My old sin nature is dead and it's gone. Bye, Felicia. I left it far behind. It's in my rearview mirror. 
I, it's so far behind me, I can't even see behind me. It's gone. I don't turn back to it. I don't, I don't ask my old sin nature, yo man, what should I do for it? No, I don't ask it for advice. I don't keep it as a, on the backpack. You know, it's not on my app. I don't keep it around anymore. It's in the trash. It's done. It's gone. That's how we're supposed to live our lives. It's gone. And the only thing that's left behind that Paul deals with of, of, of the old sin nature is one thing, and it's the body, and that's the carnal mind. The part that jacks us up, really what we have is the mind. That's the only thing that's left. That's the only thing that's left that's, that's, that, that, that is uh, sinful or, or, or fleshly. It's the carnal mind. But when we start to function it and reprogram it, that's where things change. That's what the Bible calls it, the renewing of your mind. Romans 12.2 tells us that we have to transform. We have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And that's an every moment process. That's an every second process. That's an every, every hour, every day process, like a computer. It's always processing something new. That's how we're supposed to be. It's not, oh man, I got saved in November of 2000, 2002, and that's it. I'm, just, I'm done. I, 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 I'm good. No. Every day, every second, my mind's thinking. Is it going to think the devil? Or is it going to think the Lord? Every second I have to, I have to compute what I'm going to choose, what I'm going to do. See, our lives are transformed by the renewing of our mind. So victory in every Christian, every, victory in every Christian's life is as simple as renewing of your mind. That's it. That's the victory the Lord gave you. It's not by your willpower. It's not by your circumstances. All the only victory that takes place in the outside world is right here. Am I going to choose to give in to whatever? Am I going to choose to give in to this argument? Am I going to choose to give in to this lust? Am I going to choose to give in to this greed? Am I going to choose to whatever? Are you going to continue to choose that? No. Happens right in here. What are you going to choose this morning? Are you going to choose victory or are you going to choose enslavement? It's not the struggle of two natures inside of us, guys. It's the struggle of how we think and how we receive and perceive the spiritual things. Okay. Proverbs 23 7 says that. Amen. Amen. And as we as we see us, as we if we continue to see ourselves as old sinners saved by grace, and that's it. And we will continue to struggle with sin. That's the problem, man. When, when I tell my ask young people, man, I said, oh, that's, that's the number one answer. Oh, I'm saved by grace, I'm a sinner. No, you're not, bro. Cállate la boca. No, you're not. You're a new person. You're a new person. That when we see the total change that took place in our nature, we will manifest those changes into our actions. If I know that the Lord died for me so that I can live a new life that's worthy of his obedience, his will, then I'm not going back to the way I used to be, homie. I'm not, that's not going to be me. I'm not, I'm not selling out like that. And that is, the, that is the most dominant revelation that the Lord has used to change my life. November of 2002, I came into that life-altering encounter that God wanted to get my attention. And God showed to me, he showed me that the way I was living was not worthy of a true, a rich, full, blessed life. It wasn't like that. Everything I did fell apart. Everything that I touched broke. Everything that I built up was, was destroyed. Why? Because my sinful nature did those things. I did those things. My sinful nature wanted to blame everybody else, but it was really me. I was destructive. And it wasn't until the Lord changed me on the inside, brought peace on the outside, that I have peace on peace on the inside that I have peace now on the outside. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like I'm a new person. I have a new identity. And the biggest impression that, that, that has changed my life has been the love of Christ. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. Okay. Like nothing else. It's only Jesus. Only Jesus. And I've come to know that I'm a spiritual being who has a soul and lives in a body. But the real me is my spiritual person. That's the real me, guys. The real you is your spirit. It's not your soul. It's not your body. The real person in you is the spirit that God has given you. The last time I checked, God didn't give you a spirit of fear. He didn't give you a spirit of anxiety. 
He didn't give you a spirit of depression. He didn't give you a spirit of death. He did none of those things. None of those things. God would give, God give you the ability to be, not, this is, this is the crazy thing about Jesus. That he didn't make you, the Bible doesn't say that you're just a conqueror. That's wild. He says that you're more than a conqueror. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're more than a conqueror. Man, and, uh, you know, if I can get the worship team whenever they want to come up, it's fine, Daniel, I'm going to wrap it up. But it's in the spirit that I've seen God totally change me. And he's made me, and it's a spiritual person that's made me more like Jesus. It's my spirit, man, that's made me more like the Lord. And since God, and since God is a spirit, and he deals with me on the basis of who I am in the spirit, John 4, 24 says that. This has, has changed everything. See, God doesn't deal with you mentally. He's not a shriek. He's not a psychologist. He's not a psychiatrist. He doesn't deal with you mentally. And guess what? God doesn't deal with you physically either. He doesn't beat you. He doesn't punish you. He doesn't send you to your corner or in your room. He doesn't do all those things. You know how God deals with you if you're a Christian? He deals with you spiritually. Spiritually. When God speaks to me, it's a spiritual matter, not a physical matter. It's a supernatural matter, not a natural matter. God deals with me, he's, the, the, everything's in the, in the spirit. And because I understand that now, I understand that now that, that our holy God can only truly love me because I'm a born again, have a born again spirit. That's the only one, way I can recognize that I have a true loving God is because I, ha, I am born again. I have a new spirit with me and that spirit lets me understand the spiritual things. God didn't make us on this earth to be defeated all the time. Not once in the Bible does it say that. The Bible says trials and tribulations will come. That's okay. But who do we cling on to? And if you don't understand the word of God, if you're not reading the Bible for what it really says, the scriptures of what they're really revealing to you, then how can you know who you are? Our identity comes from what God tells us. If you're going through a tough time, guess what? God is with you. That sounds cliche, but it's the truth. You know what I'm saying? If you're going through sorrow or you're going through a mourning process, guess what? God is with you. He brings joy in those times, those situations. He brings comfort in those situations. If you're lost, if you feel like you're in the desert, the Bible says that God is a guide. He's the good shepherd. That he brings us to a place of fulfillment. That's what the Bible says. He deals spiritually. And if you don't feel loved in this place, if you feel, I don't know, ugly or whatever, like, like those things, the Bible says in Ephesians 2.10, the Bible says that you're his workmanship. That you're divinely created. Fearfully made. Man, that's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. First Timothy 1 9 says that that I you know that we've dis that we're that I've discovered that I'm redeemed from the law because the law wasn't made for a righteous man. The law wasn't made for the righteous people. It was instituted because fallen people wanted to have law. It wasn't meant for them. The law was given to show us that we need our salvation, but it couldn't save us. The law couldn't save us. Romans 3 says that. But what the law couldn't do, Romans 8, 3, 4, what the law couldn't do, Jesus did. And we are righteous now because of God in Christ. We are righteous because of God in Christ. And because we are righteous and because of God who God is, and, and who Christ is, this entitles us to everything that God is and has. This is why we're children of God. We have to change the way we think. We have to use this authority that God has given us. That, that if we know who we are in the Lord, the miracles or whatever you're expecting, those things will come. Those things will come. Because God is for you. God is for you. If you
you've been struggling in this place, if you've been living your life defeated, if, man, maybe you, maybe you came in here with a bad attitude. I don't know. Let me tell you that God is for you. That God is bigger than your problems. That God is greater than any obstacle that you may have. He will remove those things. He did it for me. Right? He did it for me. He took my depression away. He took the suicide tendencies away. He took the anger away. November of 2002. Man, next year, bro, I'm celebrating big time. Next year, every 20 years, I know the Lord. I'm going to have a party for myself. <laughs> um, you know, but God is good. I know God's touching some of your guys. I know God's tugging your hearts. I know that that, that maybe there, there, there's some things that you have to release and surrender to the Lord. That's because your spirit person, your spirit being is telling you, relinquish those things. Let those things bow down to Jesus. Let those things go. Stop going to get back. It's your mind. It's your mind. Bro, do I have to be Bill Gates up in here? I'm going to send like a spiritual like firmware update right now on all you guys' minds right now. That we can catch this. That we can catch this new thinking. And it's nothing new. It's just God making us aware of who he is, amen? But if you want victory in some things in your life, and if, if you want some clarity in some things in your life, I challenge you, brother and sister, right now, that you would just come up to this altar. Come on, let's have a, let's have a good old-fashioned altar, man. If, if, if you just, there's things that you've got, you've been dealing with, there's struggles that you've been dealing with, there's identity issues that you've been dealing with, that it might not necessarily be like what the world says of identity, but... Man, who am I in the Lord? I want clarity. If that's you, stand up. Come on up. Come on up. And we'll pray for you. We'll pray that the God will touch your life. We'll pray that God will, will speak to you. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, God is good. God is good. If someone here does not know Jesus, maybe this is the first time you've ever been to church or it's been a long time. Tell you that God has you for a purpose. And the Lord is gathering his attention on you so that you can gather his attention.